Well, hello, my name is Michael Griffin. I'm a CPA. I'm also an associate teaching professor retired from the Charlton College of Business at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. I have a, I've decided to put together a, a short lecture, nine slides, to try to help anybody who's just starting in on a course in accounting or fundamental course of finance or even an MBA student who is um, just starting into an MBA program but has either a lack of, of experience with accounting or has, you may have taken an accounting course many years ago and the information has become a little bit, oh, I don't know, uh, vague to you or old or stale and you want to get up to speed quickly. Uh, again, this is just an introduction and I'm only going to really go over nine slides to keep it short and so therefore please don't think in any way I'm trying to substitute for a professor's full you know 50-minute uh, lecture for the first class or for our first few classes this is just a quick uh, introduction and I but I do think it's useful because when I teach a class like this I really believe we need to scope some things out at the beginning of the course to help make things easier later on. Uh, jumping right into a course where you're learning new rules and debits and credits and how to process transactions, how to create various reports can get a little overwhelming and you often can lose sight of the basics. So the basics, foundational type of items that we're gonna go over here today, I guess my point is should help set the stage for uh, the more efficient learning of accounting. The accounting is also referred to as the language of business. So we should be careful not to think of it as just a, a math course. Uh, there is a, a lot of language or vocabulary, uh, nomenclature that needs to be learned in order to um, really understand the topic. So let me go over just a few slides here. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna try to keep it short so that it don't bore the heck out of you, but I do want to go over some important things that can get you rolling. First of all, you see on the screen there, I have a book that's called MBA Fundamentals, Accounting and Finance. It's available on Amazon. It is used in, in some MBA programs in the United States to help students come up to speed with accounting so that they can perform better in their other MBA courses. <coughs> However, the, the book is really a fundamentals book. It's, it's not a graduate book. And a, a graduate, it, it's not like a graduate level course book. It's really written like an undergraduate book. And uh, it, it's been out and available on the market for many, many years. Gets a lot of good, I get a lot of good feedback from it. And I wanted to mention it because a lot of what I'm going to use in this lecture comes from that book. And sometimes students find that it's rather inexpensive also, that inexpensive uh, quick read book helpful in coming up with, uh, coming up to speed in a accounting or even in a finance course. Accounting and finance are close cousins. So account, what we usually do in, a, in business school is we learn accounting first and that helps us with finance. So accounting is a process of recording, summarizing and reporting financial transactions to provide useful information for decision making. Lots of times people get caught up in this idea that it's uh, it's just strictly like a scorekeeping uh, task. Uh, it, it's more than that. We do learn how to record financial transactions in a, a fundamentals accounting course. Some people call that bookkeeping. But we also need to take that a step further and to summarize that data into useful outputs um, and into reports called financial statements. We also then analyze that financial performance, analyze those financial statements to get additional insights uh, beyond what is on the face of the report so that that information can be communicated to business leaders, to um, folks who make decisions within the company and, e and also external parties like investors and bankers and others. So I guess that one thing you could say about accounting is it is an accounting, accounting is an information system with inputs, processing, and outputs, like any type of system, it has those three elements, inputs, processing, and the outputs. 
There's a long history of accounting. Accounting goes back to ancient times. There's been early uh, records that have been uncovered uh, over the years where we see that accounting practices date back to ancient civilizations like such as in Egypt and Rome where records of trade and inventory were maintained. Now, of course, these are very crude records, but it does show us the beginnings of accounting in ancient times. Clay tablets and scrolls were used to keep track of transactions and to manage the state's finances. The more modern history of accounting begins in the during the Renaissance time, about traced back to the time of Columbus, 1494, where an Italian monk and a mathematician, Lucia Pacioli, the father of accounting, they say, published a textbook on uh, accounting principles, in, and he detailed what's called double entry bookkeeping, which is still used today. That's what we teach in a lot of our accounting programs is double entry accounting, uh, double entry bookkeeping. Now, you may be getting ready to embark on a course that teaches accounting without the debits and credits, and that is done in some programs. But for anybody that's uh, studying, to go t studying to take this one step further, for example, to go and become a CPA, uh, we still require you to learn the debits and credits. Uh, so that's double entry accounting. There's rules that you have to follow when you do that. I'm not going to get into those rules here today. I'm just giving you an introduction. But when I teach this to my undergraduate students or graduate students, I will say, uh, just keep in mind, we are going to be learning double entry accounting, double entry bookkeeping. There's a set of rules there that really need to be committed to memory so that you can efficiently uh, process transactions. Uh, again, we're not, I'm not getting into that today because that takes some time, but I want to sort of alert you to that. If you're looking at learning accounting, look ahead a little bit to see if that is going to be required of you because that's something that you want to have in place. Like you want to start uh, memorizing those rules, just like if you were to play a game like the game of Monopoly or even play sports, play baseball, for example, you want to know the rules so you can properly play the game. And so eventually you have to look, learn those basic rules called double entry accounting. And they've been around uh, for over 500 years. So it's nothing new. And it is something that's programmed into technology like QuickBooks and other software packages. But if to really understand how accounting works, we often require our students to learn the rules of debits and credits. Uh, the history of accounting continues into the Industrial Revolution, the growth of businesses, the complexity of transactions that occurred during the Industrial Revolution necessitated more sophisticated accounting methods and financial reporting. And so the point there is that even though it's an old profession, it's an old process that we learned uh, with roots back at about the time of Columbus, it is a, a, a process and a a system and a set of rules that have evolved with changes in business practices. So if you look at history, you, you can follow history and big changes in commerce happen from, you know, industrial revolution right up through uh, where we are presently uh, in our history. There's a lot of rules that change. Accounting changes a little bit as we go along. It does, it ch does change slowly, but there are, uh, it is an evolutionary process, so it's quite dynamic how it changes. Uh, as I uh, took the CPA exam many years ago, I, I learned accounting under uh, some basic rules, certainly debits and credits, but what's called generally accepted accounting principles. Those principles have changed a little bit as time goes by, as business practices change. And if you were to study this, like some of my colleagues are accounting historians, uh, they'll tell you that accounting changes with major changes in commerce and the way business is done. We also have the effect of regulatory frameworks that a government uh, can change the rules on us. Here in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission has a lot to say about accounting, but also the profession itself. And the Financial Accounting Standards Board and the International Accounting Standards Board, made up of accounting practitioners, people who practice accounting, uh, do change the rules from time to time, and your textbooks are always being updated to reflect what's called FASB or the, in, and the International Accounting Standards Board. So we, we, our rules change, but they don't change fast. They change over time, and there's a deliberative process that, that works itself 
uh, through these boards and uh, also technological changes. The advent of computers and software, accounting software, has revolutionized uh, bookkeeping and accounting and made it more efficient, more accurate. Uh, globalization has had an impact on accounting as it has on all areas of business. The increasing interconnectedness of global markets has led to the harmonization of accounting standards worldwide. In other words, uh, we have tried to convert uh, our standards or converge is the right term, converge the standards uh, that are used in the United States with those that are used in other countries to come up with uh, more uniform uh, policies and procedures regarding accounting. It isn't perfect. It hasn't happened all the way yet, but globalization does have an impact, and you'll probably read more about that in your business courses. One thing I often uh, emphasize to students after we get underway, we start learning basic transactions, is that there is an accounting cycle, like a series of steps uh, to learn. And this is one of those schemas, you might say, or template that really needs to be in your mind if you're going to really learn accounting because you could say accounting is a, a process it is a, a cycle like almost a ne almost like a never-ending cycle that goes on and on uh, you you often see this illustrated as a uh, wheel you know if you can look look up look that up google the accounting cycle and you'll see a, gr a visual image of accounting that's like a wheel like spinning around and that is a good way to think about accounting because it, it never ends uh, the process, although it's often listed like eight statements like the eight steps like this. Um, and really those steps are like tasks. But once you finish number eight on the list, the post-closing trial balance, you're starting all over again at number one and working through this. So I wanted to just go through the list and just in very common terms, basic terms, talk about these steps. And then what happens when you learn accounting, you have to drill down into each of these steps to learn how it works. So for example, number one, the first thing that happens in accounting is we identify transactions. We have to figure out how to recognize a transaction. Like what I mean by recognize is when we have an event that occurs, we, we can see that event and say, wait, now that is an accounting transaction. That has an impact on the business. We recognize the economic events that are relevant to our business. That's a little bit tricky. There are rules that you can follow to learn how to do that. And after you've probably practiced on maybe 10 to 20 examples of transactions, you start to get a feel for this idea of recognizing uh, a transaction. Like when you see it, you know it after a while. But it does take practice. There are tips like, for example, if you can see that the transaction, the event that has happened, has an impact on the financial position of the business, that's, a, that's an accounting transaction. In other words, if that transaction has changed the assets of the business or it's changed the liabilities or it's had an impact on what's called equity of the business, then, oh yes, we've got a transaction. I'll give you a quick example. If you uh, see a, tra a transaction occurring like, uh, okay, uh, the company just ordered uh, 100 units for its inventory. They ordered, I don't know, uh, 100 uh, wallets. They're going to sell leather wallets, men's wallets. They just ordered it, but they haven't received it yet and haven't paid for it yet. That hasn't yet had, a, had an impact on the financial position of the business. They did not pay cash. No exchange has taken place. All they did was order some items. And that technically is not an accounting transaction. However, if the transaction was the company ordered 100 men's wallets, leather wallets, paid for those wallets, now we have a transaction. Uh, the cash has changed. Uh, we have to figure out you know, the, how much with value of cash has gone out of the business because we bought the wallets. If we received the wallets, we have to put that into inventory and we update the score for inventory. So th that first one there, what I would recommend is you, you really try to dig down into that and figure out, hey, how can I learn that something is truly an accounting transaction uh, and needs to be, we need to keep score on it, and that is the, really the start of the accounting cycle. Number two is the actual recording of the transaction, and we record in accounting initially the transactions in what's called a journal. See that term there, journalize? Journalize is uh, the verb for a journal, and a journal is like a diary, 
and you learn in the good accounting class how the transactions are entered into the journal. This is where you start working with debits and credits. What account do I debit? What account do I credit? How do I enter this into the journal? And basically, without getting into great details, it is in chronological order, minute by minute in some cases, as to what's happening in a business. And it is like a diary. Then you post to what's called the ledgers. The ledgers are different from a, uh, a journal. A ledger is an account. It's a place where we're going to keep balances. We're going to figure out in a ledger how much cash we have. We're going to figure out in a, lever in a ledger account how much we have earned for the items we've sold. Uh, the ledger is really where it's at in the end. We transfer journal entries into the ledger. So the journal is the diary, but the ledger is where we are keeping what's called accounts, and that's where we get the name accounting from, how we keep our accounts up to date. You know, an analogy would be like if you have your own checking account and your own savings account. On uh, any particular day or any particular minute, now you can go online and see how much you have in those accounts. What do you have for cash? What do you have in your savings account? Because that's a simple example. When it comes to business, there are many, many different types of accounts. Cash, accounts receivable, land, equipment, loans that the business owes, on and on it goes. You could have hundreds of accounts in a ledger. Then in step number four, we prepare our first kind of informal report called a trial balance. It's, a, it's really just a report that shows uh, that what's called the debits and credits are equal in the ledger. It is kind of a double check, almost like a control that we use in basic accounting to just see if we, we've got this what's called equality in our ledger. You learn, of course, a lot more about the trial balance. It's actually a pretty simple report, but the reasons behind it in, is, is you dive deeper into accounting in your courses. We make adjustments in the accounting cycle for some accounts that may not quite be right. This is not necessarily because of errors. It's because of what they call timing differences in, in the literature. But you adjust your accounts for certain things that have accrued, which have happened since the last time you adjusted your ledger. Uh, certain deferred items, uh, these accrued and deferred items are a little tricky to learn, but it's part of the vocabulary of accounting and adjusting entries really, we teach them, they are part of the accounting cycle, but the emphasis there really is on trying to get the account balances as accurate as possible according to the generally accepted accounting principles we follow. That allows us to go to step numbers six, where we're able to put together the financial statements. These are the reports that show what has happened over a period of time and show where we stand in terms of financial position. An analogy here would be like if I said to you, could you do a quick report for me to show me in your personal life, your personal financial affairs, how much income you've earned this year? What have your earnings been? Do you have salary? Do you have wages? Have you had some investment income? How much have you earned? And compare that to how much your living expenses have been. That's kind of like an income statement. It's a little different, but it's, it's, it, it's a good analogy. If you could show me how well you're doing earning and controlling your living expenses, that would be very similar to an income statement. Again, there's some rules that are different in business that you have to learn in order to truly understand what an income statement is. But it tells you this sort of flow thing. How did revenues come in? How, did, how much was, went out in terms of expenses for the business over a period of time? And tells us what the net income, the net earnings of the business were. The balance sheet is a little different. The balance sheet is more like a, taking a snapshot of the financial position of the business. Show us on a balance sheet what you own, what you owe, and what the difference is between those two numbers so we can see the business net worth. Again, a personal finance analogy here would be if you went to a bank for a loan and the banker said, I'd like to give you the loan, but I'd like to first see what is your personal balance sheet. You'd have to list out all your assets, everything you own personally. You'd list out all your loans and credit card balances, your mortgages and all that. And then the banker would take the difference between the two to figure out what your real net worth is, what your real net wealth is. That's similar to a company uh, balance sheet. And then the cash flow statement also shows another sort of dimension of the business. It shows how much cash went in, 
how much cash went out of the business during the same period of time as the income statement and the balance sheet. These three are the standard outputs of the accounting system. So you have one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, and five are really part of the inputs into the system. Number six is the outputs of the system. And then you're able to close things out at the end of a period, like the end of the year, where you zero out some accounts called temporary accounts and you add your wealth that your business created to an account called retained earnings. What did we retain? What did we keep in the business as a result of creating wealth by buying low and selling high, or however you want to put it, during the last operating period, which you learn in accounting is usually one year. Post-closing trial balance is a lot like number four, the trial balance. It is just a report showing what the final balances are in the account as the year is closed out, what, whether that balances out in terms of uh, debits and credits, another you know, rule you gotta learn. And it's just to verify that the accounts are ready to start the next period, which means we begin this whole cycle again. Okay, let's look at uh, financial statements and just, uh, again, just kind of go over some terms here. And I'm not really trying to make you experts on these statements, just introducing them to you and realize that the best way to learn this is to take your homework very seriously. When your professor says do homework number, problem number six tonight, it's an income statement, make sure you do it. Even if you fumble through it, uh, make sure you do it and learn how the format works, how this thing is sort of graphically arranged on a, on a, say, a sheet of paper or on a Excel worksheet on your screen. How do you set this up? It basically begins with the revenues of the business, which is uh, typical revenues of a business. Is like, what, what did we sell? Uh, what did we earn in terms of fees? What did we sell in terms of tangible items that we sold to our customers? You know, interest earned at a bank, a bank that uh, earns interest on the, the loans that people borrow from that bank. That's a type of revenue. I earn revenues off of the royalties of, my, of the books that I write and the fees that I get from my CPA clients. Uh, those are typical. A uh, landlord has rent. When landlord has rent uh, from its uh, tenants, that's a type of revenue. So you, you total these up, usually for a year, but you can do it for a, for a month, a quarter, whatever, but at least annually, what are my annual revenues? What are my expenses? Which basically at this point, the way to think about expenses of a business are the costs of doing business, the costs that were incurred, which means happened, the costs that were incurred to produce those revenues. And this allows us to show what's called profitability. Profitability is net income, the difference between revenues and expenses. The balance sheet, different view of the business. It is not like this flow concept that the income statement is. It is what you have. What do you own for assets in your business? What are the liabilities? What are the amounts owed that the business has? What, what, does, what does the business owe, owe the bank? What does the business owe its employees? What does the business owe to uh, its retirees? What does the business owe in terms of any kind of financial arrangements or contracts that they've entered into that have a dollar amount that's owed? Equity is the, basically the difference between assets and liabilities. But equity, I often tell students, equity is also, you, you should learn how equity is created. And, and you, when you study accounting, you learn that uh, equity begins with whatever the owners have put into the business, whatever the shareholders, uh, partners, uh, sole proprietors have infused into the business to get that business running. But equity is also grown over time. It can grow from another source, and that is from the income statement. If you are profitable and you plow those profits, those, that net income, you keep that in your business, the equity of the business also increases. So the difference between assets and liabilities equals equity. That's the formula of the balance sheet. Let me put that on the screen. This is a very important formula of accounting. Assets equal liabilities Oops. plus equity. So that, that's the accounting, they call that the accounting equation or the balance sheet equation. It is one of those things you want to commit to memory. The sooner you do that, the better, because usually your professor 
in the textbook that you have draws heavily on that very simple formula as a foundational piece of an accounting system. In fact, when I analyze a business transaction to figure out if it needs to be recorded in the accounting cycle, I look at that equation and I ask myself, did this transaction change the assets? Did it change the liabilities? Did it change equity? By how much? And if, when I can answer those questions, then I, I've analyzed the transaction pretty well and I can then figure out how to go ahead and record it. Cash flow statement, as I mentioned before, is going to show how much cash came in the business versus how much came out of the business from various types of activities. Operating activities would mean uh, the basic day-to-day -day work that you do. What do you sell? Uh, how much does it cost to sell things? That kind of stuff. Investing activities is another category that is shown on the cash flow statement. What did you invest in your um, equipment? What did you invest? How much did you invest in certain areas of the business? Did that investing bring any money back into the business? Cash flows, financing activities. You know, what, how did money come in because you borrowed money? Did money go out because you paid off loans? Those questions are all answered and summarized on these statements. Statements are reports. So, you know, don't make it any more complicated than that. When you are preparing, as they call it, financial statements, you are producing reports based off that accounting information system. Think of it as a database that, you that your business created as business transactions are happening. The accounts are being updated. And at some point in time, like the end of the year, you stop the show and prepare these reports like a post-game analysis of a sporting event to see where we stand, how well we did producing wealth and managing cash. I also want to make a, I also usually make a point in my first lecture that there's a very practical aspect of accounting that you should sort of sell yourself on to get yourself motivated. Uh, it's part, learning accounting is really part of financial literacy. You may not be go, you may not become an accountant. You may not become even a fine, uh, go into the finance world. But if you learn accounting, you're starting down the road of mastering financial literacy because learning accounting principles do help you down the road make informed financial decisions, both, both professionally and personally. My knowledge of accounting has helped me a great deal in a personal finance world. It's helped me manage my finances. It's given me a good vocabulary to be able to talk to other finance folks, to experts, to lawyers, and so on. And so you do build your business vocabulary. You communicate better because of accounting. Accounting is really a communication system. You, as an accountant, are really like a reporter. You're taking in the facts and you're producing output, just as a reporter is supposed to take in the facts and write a news article or write a column. You're building your vocabulary by diligently working with the financial terms and concepts of the course. Don't let any term fly by without getting at least some fundamental idea of what the term means. Be very careful not to be such a know-it-all on things like, oh, I already know what expenses are. I know what a retained earning is. Double check it because some of these terms like expenses and revenues, for example, are quite different in accounting than they are in your personal life. Like you say, oh, revenues are like what I get for a paycheck. That's similar, but that is not exactly the same in accounting. A revenue can be earned before you get the cash for that revenue. Uh, an expense can happen before any cash is paid out So in, in accounting. So it's very important to learn the terms to learn the vocabulary, to learn the language. Part of accounting is almost like learning a foreign language. So keep that in mind. That will help you. Students who get nervous about accounting often say, I'm not good with math. Well, the math is simple. The math is addition, subtraction, multiplication, and, and, and division. And it's easy. It's like elementary school math, actually. It's the vocabulary and the rules that and the logic that you have to master and and then it, taking it one step further so for example like after you take accounting can you apply this practically in such situations as budgeting investing 
finance, business financial planning, personal financial planning, you, you'll be much better off in all those areas if you really work hard to increase your financial literacy through a basic accounting course. For other folks that study this, a first accounting course is a gateway into the profession. So just quickly, uh, one part of the profession is the CPA profession, Certified Public Accountant. Uh, that professional provides services such as what's called audit, tax advisory, so income tax consulting work, um, ta income tax prep uh, return preparation, general consulting um, business type work to businesses because and a CPA can be a very well-rounded, knowledgeable uh, business person because of their study of accounting, because of that immersion they've had into how financial transactions work, how contracts work, and that rich vocabulary that they master. Qualifications of becoming a CPA, basically you have to pass an exam, you have to meet some education requirements and work experience. That differs from state to state. These are licenses that are granted by states, but for the most part, that's what you're looking at. Passing a rigorous exam, four-part exam, education, work experience. I'm not gonna go into the details of those items. If you are interested in the CPA world, the AICPA, AICPA is the national organization. They have a great website. They can show you, you know, the, the pathway uh, to becoming a CPA, but all really starts with mastering the fundamentals of accounting and finance. The certified management accountant is the is another type of certification that's quite popular in the profession. And there are others. I, I don't want to put them all on the screen here. There's lots. I could probably list a dozen different types of certifications, but these are the two main ones. And the focus here is on uh, management accounting, which is accounting uh, that's geared towards managers of companies as opposed to external parties. And financial management, it's heavy finance really in a CMA uh, exam. So it's in, what's involved here is budgeting, cost management, performance evaluation of the business, qualifications. There are two parts to that now, two exams. The education requirement is a little more flexible than the, the CPA one, which does require an accounting degree. This one, you could have accounting degree, but you also could have a degree in finance or even some other related business fields. You have to have two years of continuous professional experience in management accounting or financial management to, in order to qualify for the CMA certification. So uh, those are, that's just a very quick and dirty introduction to the fact that accounting is also a profession. It's a process, it's a system of rules and uh, principles, but it is also a professional pursuit. Uh, you can be part of the profession basically by aiming for a certification and achieving that certification. These folks are well paid. Um, there's great, great demand for this. In fact, uh, the account, accounting profession is really uh, concerned about the, the fact that there are so many unfilled positions in the field. It's just we're not graduating enough accounting majors these days. And so there are, there are tremendous opportunities, despite what you might hear about AI and robotic process automa automa RPA. Despite what we hear about RPA and AI, the, the demand for accounting graduates is through the roof. And they, there's still a lot of unfilled positions, a lot of opportunity there. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope uh, this quick lecture would help helps you uh, look at as much introductory material as you can before you dive deep into that accounting cycle. And that will set you up for success. <laughs>